So first, before I um, jump into the talk, I'd like to first understand who here is from the Netherlands? Who here is Dutch? Okay, maybe like half of people who here is not Dutch. Okay, about half of the people, some people have both hands, Dutch and non-Dutch. <laughs> I suppose you have a more of an expat international background. And who here designs for users um, based in Holland? If you design for Dutch users, actually majority. Who here designs for international users? Like you don't have international base? Okay, also plenty of you. It's really cool. My name is Jenny Shen. I'm a UX product designer, and um, I'm also a freelancer on the talent network called TapTal. In my spare time, I help co-organize a community called Ladies at UX. We also have the booth there. If you can find us at the very back with some relaxing beanbags, talk to us about diversity, um, uh, women in tech, and et cetera. I have a background of uh, living and working in different countries. I was born in Taiwan. And then when I was 12, my family moved to Canada. Since 2012, I've lived and worked in several countries from India to Singapore, US, and now I'm based in Holland. So I lived in Holland for three years now. And then um, this is kind of my travel history. I've been to close to 50 countries and I uh, live in six. And because of these cultural immersions and international experiences, I was blessed to have the opportunity to design for users um, for mul uh, multiple, from multiple countries. And now the topic of the talk is cross-cultural UX. But first, we must understand what is culture? What does that actually mean? Dutch social psychologists here at Hofstede analyze culture into six different dimensions. From Power distance, individualism, masculinity, uncertainty avoidance, long-term orientation, and indulgence. Has anyone here have heard of uh, Hope State? Here at Hope State. Okay, one, one person, Roxy. And this is uh, some of the ways that where culture can be different. And I also have this example from uh, Aaron Mayer, who did research how cultures uh, of people of different cultures can work with one another and what a difference looks like. In your own country. But in today's global economy, your skills may not automatically translate to other cultures. For instance, in some cultures, it's entirely appropriate to show emotion during a negotiation. Uh, I think to uh, raise for this story, it will be useful for your headphones because um, even put a friendly arm the sound is connected. Part. Yeah. But you, you in can others, also read from this much this. expression not only feels intrusive or surprising, but may be viewed as immature or unprofessional. Then there's open disagreement. Negotiators often assume that more expressive cultures are also more confrontational, but that isn't always the case. In some countries, such as France and Israel, emotions pour out, including disagreement. But for other very expressive cultures, such as Brazil, Mexico, and Saudi Arabia, open disagreement could be seen as insulting. Some less expressive cultures, such as Denmark, Germany, and the Netherlands, see open disagreement and debate as positive and necessary, as long as it's expressed calmly and factually. Others tend to be both less emotional and non-confrontational, which means you'll have to be especially attuned to subtle cues for both positive and negative responses. It's also important to learn how others build trust. There are two distinct types, cognitive and affective. And in a business setting, the dominant type of trust varies from one culture to another. Cognitive trust is task-based. It comes from the head and is built on your counterpart's accomplishments, skills, and reliability. American culture offers a good example of this kind of trust. In the United States, getting too emotionally close to a business counterpart is seen as unprofessional, and mixing the personal and professional is seen as risky. Effective trust is relationship-based and comes from the heart. It arises from the feelings of emotional closeness, empathy, and friendship that are developed gradually through sharing meals, evening drinks, and coffee breaks. In China, for instance, negotiators are unlikely to trust their counterparts until an effective connection has been made. Adapting your negotiation approach accordingly will help you get to yes, or si, ya, we, hi, and da. Right, so we just uh, saw Aaron Mayer's research that cultures are different. 
And uh, as you can s see from the graph, those people are confrontational and emotionally inexpressive. So what? Why do we care? Like, how does it actually relate to our work? And what does it mean for people who design product or services? According to Jacob Nelson and Elisa de Galdo, it's not enough to just translate your product or service. Users want something that acknowledges their cultural characteristics and unique business practices. So how do we do that? How do we apply these uh, cultural knowledge into our work? The first place to start would be to research the local culture. So like I said, I've lived in Holland for three years now, and I've been learning about Dutch culture and the lifestyle every single day. And this is the Dutch culture according to Hofstede. It's that they score high in individu individualism, uncertainty avoidance, long-term orientation, and indulgence. And Hofstede's analysis of the Dutch culture is that Dutch people are pragmatic, they're thrifty, and they have a high tendency to save for the future. Now, I learned a lot about this in one of my first projects at Travelberg, which uh, if you're based in Holland, you probably have heard of them. They are an online travel agency. And this project was a form to ask the user for passport data. So the problem here was that users were filling in incorrect names, like for example, they were filling in their initials or a nickname, but those are not the right names we can book them to flight with. So my task was to solve that problem, and what I did is that I designed a passport icon, I added a warning, and I made sure to said, make sure your name matches the one in your passport. If it's incorrect, you could be refused at the gate. So I thought, that's a pretty serious consequence, and surely users must adhere to the guidelines. So we rolled out this design and we tested it for two weeks. And I was surprised how this design was not effective at all. User was still filling in the anything but their name in a passport. So I was wondering, I was puzzled, like, why? So I researched into several other Dutch sites. And I found uh, this is Transavia, and this is their booking page. They have a really big section to ask, uh, are you sure? Is the name um, that you're filling the same as your passport? You can pay four euros and be able to change it, or you can pay. You have to pay 50 euros if later you want to change it. And by highlighting what is the penalty and what is the consequence related to money for them to change it, I learned that this would have worked better than my initial design. I also got to design for the, our neighbor Germany. And according to Hofstede, the German culture is high in individualism, masculinity, uncertainty, avoidance, and long-term orientation. The analysis of the German culture was that they need a systematic overview, they need details, and also they need certainty, and they require a topic to be well thought out. Here's an example from Travelbird again. This is the page where user had to select the date of the package and continue on with booking. And this is the Dutch page, and this is the German page. Did you spot the difference between the two countries? The difference was, first, there are trust badges on the bottom, and then there's this big list of inclusive and exclusive that tells the user what is included in this travel package and what is not included. Does it include three nights at this hotel? Does it include airport transfer? Does it include luggage or breakfast, and et cetera? But usually those who work in e-commerce would think that by telling the user what is not included, it could make them second guess their choice and probably go back to shop for better offers. But we actually tested this design with inclusive and exclusive, and we found that having this list with detailed information actually increased our conversion rates. So aside from learning about the local culture, you can also research the local UI patterns. When you want to present a user here more information, the more common way, or at least uh, the, the method that we see now, is a hamburger menu or the three dots that says here, more options. But did you know that in China, the hamburger menu doesn't really exist? But instead, you have a discover menu you dis discover a button with a compass icon that says, hey, discover, here are more options. 
Dan Grover, who used to work at WeChat, he studied plenty of Chinese apps and he found that this pattern appeared again and again. Where a compass icon that says discover is the norm to tell the user here are more options, more secondary options that user can tap on. Another example is Mozilla Firefox. This is Mozilla Firefox uh, UX USA homepage where it's very clean, very minimal, with only one call to action button you can literally click on download. So that's the American homepage. But let's look at the Chinese homepage. So as you can see, the Chinese homepage has a lot more information, has a lot more graphic, and it just look quite different from the USA version. And in case you're wondering, the green button is actually not to download, but is to actually post in the forum. Why is there such a big difference? Brian Pitoyo, a design strategist at Mozilla, he went to research why. And he researched the most popular sites in both China and the US. So the one that ranks the top are Google and Baidu. Without question, they are search engines who are optimized for browsing. Sorry. Uh, optimized for searching. But then when you look at the other sites like Sina, Sohu, Yahoo, they have a different layout. They basically look like newspapers with a lot of information and links and it just looks like really different from uh, a really minimal search engine. And his assumption for the difference is because of a language input. So according to him, uh, ch typing Chinese takes a long time, and it's really hard to find a precise word. If search sucks, that's optimized for browsing. We're offering a lot of links and content where user can just browse and, and click instead of typing. So that's one of the examples of East versus West and cultural difference. So if you learn about the culture, learn about the uh, interface patterns, when you want to roll out the design, make sure that you measure the data. Deskbooker is also a Netherlands-based client that reached out for me to uh, help them increase the conversion rate for Germany. So it wasn't that their service was not good. They were making a lot of sales through phone calls, but they were not making any sales through the website. So what I did is that I looked into data. Uh, for Deskbookers, I looked at their heat maps. I actually found that users first click on, before they go into searching uh, a city, they first click on links to learn more about the company. And I was trying to come up with some hypothesis and some learn about the emotional state of a user. So my assumption was that there was a lack of trust and that the website did not offer enough details for the user to proceed. So that's why they were first wanting to learn more about the company to trust them before they proceeding with any actions. So I offer my clients a few um, recommendations. First, they should put the trust um, logos, as you saw on the Travel, Travel Bird uh, German site, and as well make the site look uh, more German by adding reviews from com uh, German customers and also um, the logos of German customers and add uh, accept the payment methods that's local to the German market and add a bit more information about the company in the footer, like a German phone number, a German address, and email address that uh, go, go to the German team. So these are the changes that we made. And it takes into account of all of the recommendations I provide to the client. And with these design and content changes, we were successful to increase conversion rates for Germany. Now, a lot of people ask me, how do you know about the local culture? How do you even research this? So I'll give you a step-by-step -step local cultural, uh, culture research uh, guideline. The first place I start is Hope State's Cultural Dimensions. If you go to this uh, URL, you, you just type in the name of a country, and you can read all about how Hope State have analyzed this particular culture and or country by all of the six different dimensions. It's also very interesting to read. And also, culture is actually relative. For some cultures, something may be ambiguous or maybe too precise, but it's relative to your own culture. 
So here I would recommend typing, also compare it with your own country to see what is, um, what is the difference uh, between the cultures. And also do a lot of internal research. You can read more about culture on Wikipedia, Internations, which is a site for expats, as well as blog, uh, or even sites like iAmsterdam offer information that tell you about the local culture. And here's three things I want to uh, talk about when, uh, that, might, that might come up in your internal research. Colloquial language, characteristics, and holidays. So for colloquial language and slings, it means to adapt the local vocabulary in your marketing or microcopy. For example, Grab in, Indonesi uh, in Indonesia, they actually use the Malay, uh, Malay word taxi into their product. It tells the user, hey, here, here is the local taxi that you can call, but instead of just calling a taxi, they use the local translation of it. Or Singlish. It's a Singaporean version of English, and then it will make it more familiar or even friendlier to your user if you try to adapt it in your product and marketing. And you also can learn about characteristics. So here I have several examples I learned while living in Singapore, how Singaporean users have this culture of being gyasu. Gyasu means literally the fear of losing. It means that they are very attracted to competitions, prestige, as well as scoring good deals. This photo shows the, the lineup for free um, bubble tea that costs actually $2. So this shop, when they have the grand opening, they were giving out 100 cup, and guess what? More than 100 people showed up to try to get that $2 bubble tea. So it actually just shows how Singaporeans, usually they like the idea or the feeling of scoring a good deal because they're the one who got the free bubble tea, and other people, they, they lost out, they lose out. And you can probably, you can, uh, during your inter uh, internet research, you can find more about holidays and religion statistics. Like, here is um, a statistic for the religion, different religions and beliefs in Singapore, where they celebrate uh, Buddhist, Islam, uh, Christianity, Taoism, Hinduist holidays. So if you're today having uh, a holiday sale, if you just think about Christmas, then that's not included in that. What about Diwali? What about other cultures and ethnicity? And Lunar New Year is something that's celebrated in a lot of Asian cultures. So when Uber had this uh, feature of ordering a lion dance. Now, users from Malaysia, Vietnam, or even in the US and Singapore, they would probably find it really interesting and appreciate how Uber has localized the product to adapt to uh, local audiences. And next to internet research, you can also do informal interviews. So lately, I had a design for uh, users in Singapore, and I work for a startup, and there's not always time and budget to do comprehensive, lengthy user research. So what, what do you do when you need to interview 100 users, but you're not given any time or money? So I had this idea, if I don't have time or money to interview 100 users, why don't I talk to somebody who has interviewed 100 users? So I reached out to uh, senior UX managers and designers at various Singapore e-commerce platforms, and they were very happy to spend 10, 20 minutes with me to discuss some insights. And one of the insights I learned from a UX manager at a large e-commerce uh, fashion platform was that shopping is basically a hobby for a lot of Singaporeans. People buy something just because it's on sale, because there's not so much to do in a small country. So with that insight, it actually led me to explore having more sales callouts throughout the whole platform because according to, according to this research, then we don't have to kind of stick to the normal holiday schedule. We can just have um, uh, hol uh, sales more periodically. And when you do localization, when you design for users of different cultures, there are certain localization elements to take into account. And how do you know about this localization uh, elements? First, you can do a competitor analysis to, like what I did uh, when I researched about uh, Transavia. When you start to learn what your competitors are doing, then you start to maybe see UX, UI patterns emerge. You can also find a lot of academic research, e-commerce reports, or white papers online. And one tip, or at least something I want to share about a tip 
for doing this uh, research is that you should research in a local language, not English, not your, not your own language that you speak. So one of my colleagues actually made this mistake when we were designing for users in Taiwan. So he being the head of Asia, um, he was typing in the e-commerce terms, like e-commerce trends or mobile shopping um, in English, and he, he told me he couldn't find any data. Therefore, perhaps there's not so much research. Then what I did is that I entered those terms, but in Mandarin, Mandarin Chinese, into, into Google, and I found so much data. I found so much e-commerce report that tells us about the mobile shopping behaviors of Taiwanese users. So lesson learned is that try to work with the local so that you can research in a local language instead of your own language or English. And here's a list of localization elements that you can be aware of. There are actually so many out there, but I just want to discuss uh, a few today. So I'll pick four things to explain. First thing, the official language. So it's obviously in Holland is Dutch, in Germany is German, but then you might also encounter countries where English is one of the official languages, like Singapore or India. But then pay attention to, do they use English? Do they use US English? Do they use UK English? Because you, it's a small detail, but then you don't, definitely don't want to upset the local users. And as well, if there's a country that speaks Chinese, it's a simplified Chinese or traditional Chinese. And finally, some country have dialect, where there's, in one country, there's different languages being spoken, like Canada, there's French and, and English. You definitely want to be aware of the local languages. Next is holiday sales or um, sale periods. If you work in e-commerce, this is a huge part for you. The highest gross revenue sales across the globe is a single state in China. So if you have Chinese user in your demographic, you definitely do not want to miss out targeting for single state. As well, we know about the Black Friday, we know about Boxing Day, and did you know that in Singapore, the equivalent of that is a Great Singapore Cell, which were actually really busy uh, pumping out the design for Great Singapore Cell. And as well, why Valentine's Day is something that's celebrated in a lot of Asian countries, um, where all of the marketing graphics are white. And then you can research about internet speed. According to the stats, uh, um, the highest average connection speed is in South Korea. But when you compare it with other countries around the world, you can actually see a huge difference. So internet speed affects how the user uses your product or app or website or whatever. And then you definitely want to test how is the experience with users who are coming from a country where the average internet speed is slow, slower and see if everything loads properly, see if everything offers a good user experience. And lastly, you can also find about device or smartphone stats. I like to use this handy tool called Stat Counter, which you can actually find the stats by region or by country, and it gives you a breakdown of every uh, country's browser stats and what is the majority, that, which is really helpful when you're designing for responsive design or, um, or et cetera. So this is an example of how Argentina compares with Australia. So after all the cultural research, after all the localization, I have some final tips here for everyone here. If you want your product or service to dominate a world where it's adapted by a wide range of users, now, you're probably gonna, yeah, dominate the world. First tip is to have a diverse team. If you're building a product for international user, it's definitely an asset to have people in your company that can offer different perspective, and, and even if they speak different languages, it's definitely an asset uh, for your company. And according to this London-based creative agency that work with clients all over Europe, they said having different mixed background is an asset because ideas bounce back differently and you end up making really interesting connections and inspirations. So if you were in the diversity panel earlier, you'll see that we were discussing this a lot and how having different backgrounds and experiences is actually an asset that teams who are, who are interested to design for users of different culture can definitely benefit from. And the other tip is to travel and do ethnographic research. 
Is anyone here travel from another country to come to the conference? We are local. Oh, okay. A few, few people. That's great. So aside from design, travel is my biggest passion. I love to travel. And did you know that when you travel and when you live by like a local, you can actually learn so much about the local culture and has become one of my biggest assets when I design for international users because I have actually lived and traveled to those countries. And if you love travel, you can be happy to know that travel helps you have a more positive view on cultures and just cultures in general and be more open to diversity. So if you want to dominate a world with your product or service, try to travel more and try to understand a local's perspective. Perhaps you can talk to your Airbnb host, perhaps you can attend some local meetup and try to understand what is the, the state of a country, what are the reasons what make a country the way it is now. So try to make more local connections. When you're designing for users of different cultures, this can um, really help you. So here are all the things you can do, but there are things that you probably don't want to do when you're designing for users of different cultures. And what you don't want to do is Google Translate or use any machine translation services for anything that goes on production. Or maybe this can happen. You know, Google Translate, it's, it's fast, it's free, what can go wrong? And this is actually a real example that I, I actually hope that they would have, um, they probably should have consulted with a local that speaks Chinese before they end up making this decision. So this is a business card um, of a Dutch company who were invited to have a meeting in China. So then out of best intentions, they translated the business card. But as a native Chinese speaker, I can spot a few things that they didn't do correctly. So first, um, the last name translation. For some reason, his name, Vish, is translated to Ko. So that means his Chinese partner is probably calling him Mr. Ko, Mr. Ko, while he has no idea why. Secondly, the phone number. The phone number uses a Dutch format with an M and then a space between every two letters. But to a Chinese person, this looks kind of random. and it, I would have no idea what it means unless I moved to Holland because it's really difficult to read as well for a Chinese person who need a Chinese card in the first place. They probably don't understand what the M means anyway. It means mobile, but a Chinese person would probably not know that. And lastly, best from Amsterdam is translated into better be from Amsterdam. Thank you. Questions? Sure. Should I, should I use this? You want? Yeah, any questions? Nadia has a question. So first of all, I think a great talk. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, I yeah, can, I, hold on. Um, so I was curious, uh, I was just saying the great talk. I definitely learned the thing. Uh, not maybe one. Um, when you are saying, for example, about that you learned that people in Singapore l l love sales, for example, and then you mentioned that you understood that maybe you should use more like sales um, banners or like sales signs in your designs. Um, kind of like, what is the, the, also like, have you ever, let's say, have this ethical questions, like uh, to what extent do you need to like use this kind of like, um, not against users, but you kind of, you know what I mean. Like, what is this ethical ethical line lies there? Like, uh, that you can use what you learned about country, like, uh, to make users buy or to make users visit the product more and to kind of, like, make them more addictive to the product? That's an interesting question. However, I think the ethics of that, if the users love sale, they love a good deal, then why not give it to them? I think when we are working in e-commerce, for example, like a product, we imagine the user should go through the flows. Exactly the same thing. User experience to make the flow as easy as possible for them to finish whatever task they are doing. So I see e-commerce is, is the same. However, depending on what topic you're talking about in which extent you localize, yeah, it, I think it really depends on the topic. But personally, I think that when you know the users of the country love sales, 
I would just give it to them because they love buying. They have, as according to the interview, in former interview, they have nothing else to do. And they're very proud, actually. They're very proud and happy when they scored a good deal. So I personally think that using that is not unethical. Any other questions? No, looks like no. Thanks, everyone.